mystics. Um, so this series is going to co concentrate on, on four of the mystics of the Carmelite tradition, St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, Brother Lawrence, and, and St. Therese. Uh, and I'm going to try to give a basic introduction to, to each of them. Um, and so, and there'll be time for questions and answers, some spiritual practice, as the program says, and so on. Those of you who already know something about these saints may, may find it's fairly basic, so you're not obligated to stay till the end, but uh, you're, you're most welcome. So this evening I'll be presenting uh, Teresa of Avila, the first woman to be declared a doctor of the church, um, and uh, especially for her teaching on prayer. And interestingly, uh, she's, well, I'll, I'll come back to her in a second now. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I wanted to say that she's quoted five times in the Catholic uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is more often than, than many of the other doctors of the church. And she's highly regarded by other Christians uh, as well, and even by those of other faiths. So I think she has a lot to teach us. And we could do a whole series on Teresa alone. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll try to scratch the surface this, this time. This is actually a painting that was done of her during her lifetime. Now that, I mean, the, the words over her head and, and the Holy Spirit and all of that was added later. But uh, she was asked to sit for this uh, painting. And afterwards, it was one of the Carmelite friars who did it. She said, God forgive you for making me so bleary eyed. So she, she didn't uh, appreciate the painting that much, but... Uh, but it is the only one they know was, was done from, from her, from, from life. Uh, so let's begin with, a, with an opening prayer. And, and at this point, I, I just like to use a very short prayer, the famous bookmark of, of St. Teresa. Uh, uh, and this was found on, on a bookmark in, in her breviary after her death. And they're not even sure that she actually wrote it. I mean, it could have been written by somebody like John of the Cross and given to her, but it, it's, 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 it was among her, her, her texts. So uh, it, it, let's pray, put ourselves in the presence of God. Let nothing disturb you, nothing make you afraid. All things are passing. God alone never changes. Patience gains all things. If you have God, you will want for nothing. God alone suffices. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. Okay, so as I said, we're looking at, at uh, St. Teresa this evening. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned that she's appreciated by those, uh, by other Christians as well. For example, Archbishop Rowan Williams, uh, the uh, former uh, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, wrote, a, wrote a very excellent book on Teresa some years back. Uh, even uh, those of other faiths uh, read her writings. Uh, but before I jump into Teresa, I think I, I want to explain a, just a little bit about the Carmelite tradition out of which she came, because I think that's important for, for understanding Teresa and the others we'll be talking about. Now, the Carmelites, uh, according to contemporary historians, they started around the year 1200 as a group of hermits on what was uh, called near what was called the Fountain of Elijah on Mount Carmel in northern Palestine during the time when the Crusaders controlled that area. It's up above the modern city of Haifa on, uh, in, a, in a kind of a valley on Mount Carmel. And we don't know the names of these first hermits, but within a few years they approached the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, Albert, to give them a formula of life which they could follow. That's, that's a picture of the ruins on Mount Carmel where the monastery once was. Uh, so this document that Albert gave them evolved into what's known as the, the, rule, of, uh, the rule of St. Albert or the Carmelite rule. Uh, it's very brief, but it's a guiding document for all later generations of Carmelites. And at the heart of this rule is a, a paragraph that says that Carmelites are to quote, stay in their cells, meditating on the law of the Lord, that is the scriptures, day and night and keeping watch at prayer unless attending to some other duty. So as we'll see, uh, Teresa and many other Carmelites in the tradition took this to mean that unceasing prayer, which St. Paul recommends in, in the New Testament, unceasing prayer is at the heart of the Carmelite way of life. And this is why Carmel is especially known as the order of, of prayer and contemplative spirituality. Uh, 
among the religious orders in the church. Uh, in the same rule, Albert told the hermits to build a chapel in the midst of their hermitages. And they did build the chapel and they dedicated it to Mary. And to the feudal mind, that meant taking Mary on as your, as your special patroness, the special lady of the place, the one under whom you fight your spiritual battles, your, your protector and, and so on. And later on, the Carmelites would come to regard her as mother and even sister in their way of life. And that was the beginning of, of, of uh, an ever-growing Carmelite devotion to Mary and a strong self-identification as a Marian order, uh, particularly after the, the official title becomes the, the Brothers of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And you know how widely devotion to Our Lady of Mount Carmel is spread throughout the world. There's a picture up above of, a, of an, our, uh, a procession for the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in a fishing uh, village, I think, a fishing town. Um, um, what had, so these, these Carmelites then, these hermits, they're on Mount Carmel in the Wadi or around the year 1200, but now the Muslims are coming back in and reconquering the Holy Land from, uh, from the Crusaders. And so the hermits are forced to move to Europe. And when they get to Europe, they, they see that, you know, what they need to do to adapt is to join the Vendican orders, like the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Augustinians, and so on. But unfortunately, the, the Carmelites didn't have a, a famous named contemporary founder like Dominic or Francis. And they realized they had started near the fountain of Elijah on Mount Carmel, and they were a little cloudy about their history. And so little by little, they started to claim that uh, Elijah himself had founded the Carmelites. So in Teresa's time, there was still this very strong belief that historically the Carmelites went all the way back to the prophet Elijah and that there had been a continuous line of them praying on Mount Carmel. Um, and the medieval Carmelites tried to link Mary and Elijah too, like they interpreted that passage where, where uh, Elijah's servant sees a small white cloud rising over the sea as uh, Elijah recognizing that that's a, a, a foretelling of Mary and all the grace that's gonna come through the incarnation. Uh, so all of this is just to say that, uh, uh, that for three centuries before Teresa came along, the Carmelites were already a religious family, strongly get it, dedicated to Mary and Elijah and strongly committed to prayer. And I think that's helpful background for the people we'll be looking at because it's hard to fully understand Teresa and John of the Cross and Lawrence and Therese without knowing something about that, that Carmelite tradition that, that shaped them. So um, when we talk about Carmelite mystics, we're talking about Carmelite mysticism. And what, what is that mysticism? One way I think of trying to tie these four figures together is to focus on what each one of them has to tell us about the presence of God. Um, and interestingly, uh, Bernard McGinn, who's written this massive uh, multi-volume history of Christian mysticism, uh, points out that uh, Christian mystics don't often speak, uh, don't as often speak about mystical union or undifferentiated union with God and so on, but they have a lot to say about the way God is present to us and how we experience that presence and how we can cultivate a response to that presence and so on. So the general title of his, uh, his entire series on the history of Christian mysticism, including Carmelite mysticism, is the presence of God. You know, McGinn, who's the contemporary expert on mysticism, argues that that's a better way of understanding what mysticism is for Christians than trying to focus on just extraordinary experiences of union. Okay. And I think that fits the Carmelite tradition very well, because if you go even all the way back to Elijah, when he first appears uh, in the scriptures, the very first thing he says is, as the Lord lives in whose presence I stand. So uh, he comes at a time when Israel is forgetting it's, it's God. Um, they're, they're following uh, Baal and uh, Ahab is promoting false religions and so on. So Elijah appears and says, I live in the presence of God. The Lord lives in whose presence I stand. This God is alive and active. And uh, down through the centuries uh, to, to our time, uh, we have uh, thousands of years later, this Carmelite uh, friar Titus Bransma who's going to be canonized in a few weeks. Uh, he wrote in a book called Carmelite Mysticism, Historical Sketches, quote, 
this living in the presence of God, this placing oneself before the face of God is a characteristic which the children of Carmel have inherited from the great prophet. And his contemporary, Edith Stein, another Carmelite, in her essay on the history and spirit of Carmel, agrees that the vocation of the Carmelite is to, quote, stand before the face of the living God like Elijah. So uh, this theme of divine presence and, and how we respond to it, I think, gives us a useful lens for reading the Carmelite mystics. Um, okay, so you're probably wondering, okay, that's all good, but when am I going to talk about St. Teresa? Uh, so that's what I want to switch to next. And uh, just to give you a, a bit of biographical information about her. And this part, I haven't written everything down in the slides, but uh, I've got some images from, from where she was, where she grew up. She was born in Avila in central Spain uh, in 1515 into relatively comfortable circumstances. You can see in the map on the left, we've got the Spanish empire of, of Teresa's time. And uh, on the right, a map of, of Spain itself with the little blue uh, indicator there, right where Avila is to the Northwest of Madrid. So she, she was born there in kind of the central part of, of Spain. Uh, and remember, I mean, this was, this was the time when Spain was at its high point. It was the world's superpower. Uh, in 1492, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella had captured the last Muslim stronghold. Uh, they, they had unfortunately expelled the Jews from Spain, uh, but they had sent uh, um, uh, Columbus off to, to the Americas. And uh, again, within a few years, by the time Teresa comes along now, we're moving into the era of Philip II, who was, uh, you know, they, the Spanish, Spaniards had territories all over the world. Just a second, there's a plane going by, if you hear that in the background. So she, she's born and raised in, then in, in Avila. Uh, and that's, it's a walled city. It's very uh, picturesque. It's, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, and you can see this map on the right that sort of shows that, you know, her world was relatively small here. Um, this where it says Convento de Santa Teresa, that's where her house was just inside the walls. That's, that's built on her former home. Up at the top middle, you see Monastery of the Incarnation. That's pointing to where, where the, the Carmelite convent was that she joined. And then over on the far uh, right, you see Convento de Santa Ana and Convento de San Jose. San Jose was the reform community that she founded first. So all this is happening within a, you know, a 20 minute walk of, of each place. Um, so her father, Alonzo, the one in, the, in this house there inside the walls, uh, had two children by his first wife, first wife named Catalina, 10 children by his second wife, Teresa's mother, Beatrice. Now, it was fairly common in those days, sadly, that uh, often women would marry very young and then would have a whole series of children and would die worn out or even in childbirth at a relatively young age. So Teresa lost her, her mother when she was a teenager. Um, but she came from a family with lots of uh, uh, a very large family with many social connections in Avila. Um, they were members of the, the minor nobility of Avila. But one of the shocking discoveries in, in the 20th century was that, uh, in fact, they had bought the, the, this family had bought their way into this social rank in order to cover up uh, the Jewish ancestry on her father's side. Now, because all the Jews had been expelled from Spain or were forced to convert, there was a lot of suspicion and a lot of anti-Semitism in Teresa's time. Uh, maybe these ones who converted weren't really uh, uh, Christians at heart and so on. So, I mean, this was one of the things that the Inquisition was always uh, looking into. And so it was, it, was, uh, it was a touchy question, actually, for Teresa's family. Um, uh, there was a great emphasis on, on purity of blood at that time in Spain. Teresa learns to uh, read and write at home. Well, this is, this is, these are some pictures of, of uh, what's left of her, of her home. That church there, that, that's the one that's built on her childhood home. Uh, oh, that's the upper right. Uh, down in the lower left, that's a little enclosed garden inside the, the uh, premises that they have a statue of where Teresa and her brother Rodrigo were supposed to have, have played. Uh, above that is the baptismal font nearby where she was baptized. And the lower right is supposed to be the room where she was born. And they tried to set it up the way it might have been in those days. 
um, although there weren't any photographs available at the time. Um, so uh, um, she grows up then uh, um, in the family learning uh, to sew, to read and so on. She becomes a great lover of books, which was unusual at that time because many women weren't even taught to read in at that time in Spain, a lot of uh, illiterate people in Spain. And she was a pious child, um, um, uh, but, uh, and there are some pictures of incidents she talks about in, in uh, her book of her life, a uh, lower, lower right, she and her brother building uh, a hermitage is out of stones. And there's a story uh, up above there on upper right where she and her brother ran off to get martyred by the Moors, but were brought back by their, uh, by their uncle. Uh, interestingly enough, they're running off to be martyred by the Moors wearing Carmelite habits. I don't know why, but uh, she wasn't a Carmelite at that point. So who knows, but I suppose the painting is probably from a Carmelite monastery. <clears throat> So, but when she's a teenager, her mother has died, her older sister has gone off and she's getting interested in the finer things in life, social life, uh, perfumes, nice dresses and so on. So her father's getting worried about her and he packs her off to a nearby Augustinian convent school, uh, Our Lady of Grace, when she's about 16. Uh, the school still, the building still stands there. Um, and uh, sh she doesn't like it much, but, uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's a sister in the community who takes an interest in Teresa and teaches her how to pray. And so she begins to think more seriously about her life. Uh, she, she thinks she's, she's not uh, uh, particularly attracted to uh, marriage or the convent. Uh, the options for women were fairly limited at that time, but she eventually decides to join the convent because uh, out of concern for her own salvation, uh, given her temperament and so on. Uh, 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 let's see. So at the age of 20, she enters the local Carmelite convent of the Incarnation in Avila. It's about a 20 to 30 minute walk from where her home was. And I hope the pictures aren't too blurry for you to see, but the upper left there is the, is the compound of the Monastery of the Incarnation as it is today. And you see it's a huge uh, complex. Um, the uh, uh, on the right is, is uh, one of the kitchens in, in there. I think that was her kitchen. Lower left is the room she had in the incarnation. Uh, middle middle in, at the bottom is their, is their chapel. And uh, to the lower right is a, is a statue that uh, stands outside the, the convent today uh, of Teresa as a pilgrim. Uh, but uh, um, you know this, this convent was quite large, not very strict. Uh, the women were not evil. I mean, they were, it was filled with uh, good souls and so on. Um, uh, they prayed together. I mean, they had mass together. They celebrated liturgy, the hours and so on. But all of those class divisions in Spanish society were brought into the convent. Um, uh, uh, some of the rich and noble nuns, for example, insisted on titles of honor and they were given suites of rooms where they could entertain family and relatives. The poorer nuns had to sleep in dormitories. Um, the community was often short of funds, so the sisters had to go out sometimes just to get a square meal. Um, and uh, uh, some of the sisters, like Teresa, were encouraged to spend a lot of time in the parlor with visitors so that they could uh, uh, chat them up and, in hopes of getting uh, big donations. But at this time, anyway, a lot of the donations to convents came with all sorts of strings attached. Like if you, we're, we're gonna give you a big amount of money, but for that, you have to promise that you'll, you'll uh, say so many prayers, say five rosaries for us every day or something like that. Um, so after a while, I mean, a convent like the Incarnation ended up with all sorts of uh, busy obligations of vocal prayer, all these prayers they had to be saying for benefactors, which, which uh, complicated their lives. Um, Teresa, when she joins, she says she find, finds it su surprisingly congenial, but it's not too long before her health breaks down. Um, they don't know exactly what it was, but she sent off to a, to a healer, a curandera, uh, in 1538. And uh, she, on the way, she, she visits a, a pious uncle of hers, and he introduces her to the prayer of recollection through a book by... Uh, Franciscan called Francisco de Asuna. So she starts practicing this prayer of recollection and, and she's making progress. But the curandera's treatment uh, almost kills her and uh, she's left paralyzed. 
paralyzed and uh, she's only able to walk again, she tells us, after she prays to St. Joseph and she's healed. And so she develops a lifelong devotion to St. Joseph. She becomes a great promoter of St. Joseph. And a lot of, uh, you know, wherever she could, when she founded a new monastery, she would name it for St. Joseph. Uh, so, um, yeah, this, this is that Francisco de Asuna, who, uh, his book that talks about the, the prayer of recollection. And she also read books like uh, uh, The Ascent of Mount Sion by, uh, by Bernardino de Laredo. So she's reading about prayer and spirituality. But she's, uh, she's, let me go back a second there. She's kind of letting her prayer life uh, slide. Um, she prefers to spend more time gossiping in the monastery parlors. She says this went on for almost 20 years. When she was there in the parlor, she would wish, she would think she should be praying. When she was praying, she'd wish she was back in the parlor. So she felt torn between those desires for prayer and desire for pastime. But finally, in Lent of 1554, and she's already now 39, which is not young, especially in Spain at that time. She, she sees an image of the wounded Christ and she's very much moved and she begs for the grace to change her life. And she reads the confessions of St. Augustine too. And this marks what people call her second conversion. So from this point on, she recommits herself to the practice of what's called mental prayer, meaning that it's not just reciting a lot of vocal prayers, but doing meditations. Uh, quiet prayer and so on, which we'll, we'll talk about her teaching on that. And as she's doing that, she's making uh, steady progress in the spiritual life, but she starts having unusual experiences, visions, voices, and so on. And she's getting advice from a lot of confessors and, uh, and uh, friends and so on, uh, who think that, oh, Teresa, this has got to be from the devil, because you were leading such a... a, a, a uh, it distracted life before this couldn't be from God. And so they tell her to reject all these experiences, but she feels they're giving her benefits. So she's in a real quandary until she finally gets more, more understanding confessors. Um, but one of her confessors is pressing her for more details. And so she writes her first major work for him, the book of her life. Um, and uh, in the second draft of that, as we'll see, she inserts a little uh, a little kind of mini treatise on, on degrees of prayer, the stages of prayer, something called the four waters, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. Okay, still, everybody still with me? <clears throat> okay, in 1560, when she's 45 now, uh, several important things occurred. Uh, for example, she has a, a vision or some kind of experience of the place that she deserves in hell because of her sins. And it's, it's an interesting experience. It's not fire and brimstone, but it's a kind of a dark and closed place with vermin and muddy and everything. Uh, she's all alone there. And uh, I always think that's a good metaphor for what her life would have been like without the grace of God in it. She would have just ended up closed in on herself and alone. Um, okay. Somebody wants to be admitted there, okay. Uh, um, but interestingly, when, after she has that experience, her, her immediate reaction is not to be, oh, what, you know, I better do something so that I don't go to hell. Her reaction is, what can I do to help others? Especially from what she was hearing with the Protestants in, in Europe who were destroying churches and so on. Um, she's, she's wondering, what, what can she do? She can't be a theologian. She can't be a missionary because of the, you know, at that time, there were no women who were such things. Um, so she says, given, you know, the, the limits placed on women and nuns at that time, what she can do, she says, is to keep her rule perfectly. And for that, that meant recommitting herself to unceasing prayer. And, uh, and so uh, that's what she's doing now. But uh, uh, in, in September 1560, uh, she's having a conversation uh, in her room at the Incarnation with, with friends and relatives. And one of the relatives raises the idea, they're talking about, well, how the hermits lived on Mount Carmel. Wouldn't it be great if we could do something like that today? And, uh, you know, it wouldn't be that difficult. We just need to get some sponsors and so on. We can start a community like that. Um, and, uh, you know, Teresa doesn't say much at that moment, but it, then she hears from the Lord in prayer that she should pursue this idea. Uh, so you, if you were reading that text I have there, uh, 
she's she's thinking about what she can do to uh, keeping the rule perfectly and so on. Uh, yeah, and here's here's the cell where they had that conversation. So she's saying that you know it happened once that someone mentioned to me and to the others that if we couldn't be nuns like the Discalced Franciscans, we could still found a monastery and so on. So she's thinking about this now. Where can I? How can we start something where we'll be able to dedicate ourselves more completely to prayer? As she understood uh, the Carmelite uh, vocation. And the Lord tells her to, to go ahead and work on this, and, and uh, she, as she's describing this in a book of her life. And so it comes about then that she makes her first foundation of her reform at San Jose. This is uh, uh, where you, you can visit it now, too, if you go to Avila. This is San Jose in Avila. It's founded in 1562. Um, there were many struggles to get it going, which I won't go into, but that's the, that's the big first step for uh, uh, Teresa. Um, and she arranges things there to kind of um, off, to, to offset the, the difficulties that she had experienced at the incarnation. So instead of a big community where people were into little groups and didn't really know each other well, she wanted the community to be, at first, she said only 13, like Jesus and the apostles. Later, she raised it to 21. But the most important thing was that in the, in the community, uh, everybody would, would know each other well, and they would all be friends supporting each other in this life of prayer at the service of the church and the world. In place of the social distinction that the incarnation, she insisted that everybody would be equal. They would go by religious names rather than family names. They wouldn't use titles. Instead of burdening themselves with obli extra obligations to vocal prayers given imposed by benefactors, they wouldn't accept any gifts uh, with strings attached. They would just take free will offerings and, and also help support themselves by their work. Instead of complicated chanting at liturgy, they would sing things recto tono um, um, and so on one, on one note. Um, they would be enclosed so that there wouldn't be so many distractions, uh, and they would cultivate detachment, humility, love for each other, affability, and virtues like that. Uh, and while she's at San Jose, then she, she finishes uh, another book called The Way of Perfection. The sisters had asked her to write something about their vocation, to explain it, to, to explain how they were to pray, and... Uh, and, and, and so on. And that's probably the most accessible of her writings because for that book, she doesn't get into talking about visions and voices and raptures and so on, because you know, she knew that some of her sisters would be put off by that. So she, she's writing uh, you know, just in a way that most people could relate to. But while she's here at San Jose, uh, they get a, missionary, um, a visit from a missionary to the Americas who tells her about all the souls being lost in, in the Americas for want of uh, evangelists to preach the gospel. So she's heartstruck by this and she prays about it and she, uh, what can she do? And she hears the Lord say, well, wait, wait a bit, daughter, and you'll see great things. Uh, so this missionary came and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, this, this is talking about, this is a room in, in uh, in uh, San Jose, this is her praying before the image of Christ and hearing that wait a bit and you and you will see great things. Uh, yeah, he showed me much love manifesting his desire to comfort me and said wait a little daughter and you will see great things. So what happened that actually fulfilled this was the general of the Carmelite order, uh, a man named uh, Giovanni Rossi or they called him Rubeo in Spain, finally arrived in, in Avila in 1567 to see what was going on. And Teresa was afraid that he would disapprove of what, what she had done, but actually he was very taken with it and very impressed. And he encourages her to make uh, more foundations uh, of the same. And uh, uh, the story goes that he told her to, to make as many foundations as she had hairs on her head. I don't know how, how they counted that, but... Uh, um, uh, so, so now she's, she's got the encouragement. This is the something that she can do for the Lord is make more communities of, of her reform. And uh, she's also thinking about if she's going to do this, the numbers of the, of the, of the regular Carmelite friars in Castile are, are, are not many. She'd like to start a male branch of this renewal movement uh, so that they can help, help her nuns. And uh, among her first recruits was uh, 
was John of the Cross. Uh, and we'll talk about him uh, the next time we meet. And uh, so although she's, she's not young anymore, she's, uh, 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 you know, she, she's, she spends the, the last part of her life founding this series of convents. And uh, um, yeah, here she's getting permission to, to, uh, to recruit friars. John of the Cross is her, among her first recruits. And by the time of her death in 1582, 17 Carmels of her nuns had been established and numerous uh, communities of her friars. And uh, this is a map of uh, all the places where, she, where uh, Teresa was able to make foundations. So you see, she was all over Spain uh, doing this work, uh, even despite her fragile health. Uh, um, and uh, when she dies, finally, you know, she, she had managed to avoid all the pitfalls that the other women of her time had fallen into. There was a lot of suspicion of women to begin with. They were thought to be kind of uh, 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 easily suggestible, easily fall into heresies and so on. So people were looking at Teresa kind of suspicious of her. There was the theologians were suspicious of the people who were promoting mental prayer as she was. Uh, because they were afraid this would end up in some kind of heterodox uh, illuminist movement. And uh, she had this Jewish ancestry, and, and that was a kind of a, 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 a strike against you in Spain at that time. So somehow she managed to, to get through uh, all of the, this landmine, this landmine field without, uh, uh, you know, negotiated it successfully, I should say. Um, and when she dies, her last words, among her last words are, at last I die a daughter of the church. And that was very important for her that she hadn't, you know, she hadn't run afoul of, of uh, the church's teaching and, and she'd always uh, stayed a loyal daughter of the church. So that's my brief biographical sketch. Um, maybe, uh, and, and here are some, if you wanna learn more about Teresa, uh, and I'll show this at other, other times too. I mean, these are some of the resources in the USA. There's the Center of Carmelite Studies, which I'm the chair. There's the Carmelite Institute of North America, which is nearby. And I, I'm actually the president of that. There's ICS Publications, which publishes the writings of St. Teresa and Carmelite Media, which, which also publishes Carmelite texts, uh, uh, some related to Teresa. And there are lots of other places too. This is just a, a brief selection. So uh, I'm going to stop the share for a moment here before I go on and uh, see if, if people have any questions or comments at this point. If you have any questions, just please submit them in the chat and I will okay. forward them to Father Stephen. Where is the chat? It should be along the bottom line of the, uh, of, of the Zoom window. It is? Where is the chat window? I don't see it. If you go to, uh, there should be a little tab on the bottom that says more with three dots. And if you click on that, there should be the top um, word should be chat. And you just click on that. May I suggest you have to put your cursor down at the bottom, then you'll see the icons and you'll see the chat icon. Yeah. So I have, okay. a, I have at least two questions for you, Father. Okay, and after the questions, then I'm gonna go on to talk about, I mean, I talked about her life, but I wanna talk about her teaching as well. So I'll, I'll say something, uh, okay, yeah. Um, there is one, there's at least a few questions here. Mm -hmm. What distinguishes the OCD from the OCARM in our day? In our day? Um, well, that's always a, a, an interesting question. And there are lots of landmines in that question too. Um, uh, I mean, we still are both part of the Carmelite family. I, I, uh, one thing I say sometimes is that, uh, is that the Discals call Teresa our Holy Mother. The Ocarms don't because she's one of their saints, of course, but she's not kind of looked on as the foundress the way we look on her. And uh, as a result, I mean, when we read the Carmelite rule, we kind of read it through the eyes of St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, and, uh, you know, we understand what it says about prayer through her interpretation, more so than I think that the Carmelites would feel necessary, the, the Ocarms. Um, so, I mean, it used to be in, in the past that uh, 
that uh, the discalced Carmelites were very slow to take on any active uh, active apostolates like schools or parishes and so on. Uh, well, the Carmelites uh, had lots of schools here in the in the country and so on. But that's changed over time. Like a lot of the a lot of uh, discalced Carmelite communities now are are in parishes, uh, working in parishes and so on. So I don't know. That's a that's a quick answer to a complicated question. Uh, next question. Yeah. Uh, another uh, person asks: Did the convents founded by Teresa survive on just donations, or did they sell items or have some other form of income? Well, um, that's a good question too. And I, I, I remember reading about this. Uh, Teresa's idea was that they would live off their own handiwork, and even today, I mean, you have some Carmels of the nuns that make you Eucharistic breads or 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 do uh, greeting cards or make vestments or something like that. So they help to support themselves. But even in Teresa's time, it was usually the case that they they had to rely on on donations uh, of various sorts. And it it always helped that at the time. I mean, Teresa became very famous. It's like having Mother Ter Mother Teresa as your foundress. You know, people are want to donate. Uh, people want to be associated with it. So, but I mean, that's always a struggle for the, the, the communities of the sisters. Sometimes they get very generous benefactors, other times they're really struggling. So. Great. Another question okay. is what sort of things would Teresa have read? Would she have been exposed to other faiths that have meditation? Um, well, she liked to read spiritual books. Uh, one of the things she complains about, though, is that during her time, the books in the vernacular were a lot of them were put on the index, so she couldn't read them anymore. But I think she she tended to read books on prayer, like uh, Francisco de Asuna, Bernardino de Laredo, and, and so on, Augustine's Confessions, the Letters of Saint Jerome, things like that. Uh, there is a famous uh, Life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony that everybody read in those days. Um, uh, so. Some of those sorts of books in particular, I think. Um, uh, it, it just depended on what was available in the vernacular. Um, uh, one of the things they didn't have access to directly was the Bible, because uh, I mean that you know that it became that access to the Bible and the vernacular got restricted. Um, but I mean, she compensated for that because they recited the office together. They uh, uh, some of the authors she read quoted scripture. She heard sermons on scripture quite regularly. So she was able to get something from that. Um, okay, Father, should I go have, on to, sorry. Um, would she have known the works of any medieval mystics like John Rusbroek or even the Cloud of Unknowing or um, would, would she have known any, any of those, those folks? I'm not really sure. I think she might have. She she knew of Catherine of Siena and people like that, for example. But uh, I don't know how many of her writings she had access to. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, we have other questions, but we can save those until the okay. end. Okay. So let me say something about Teresa's writings and her teaching, which is really what I, I should be, I suppose, uh, uh, spending the most time on. Well, Teresa is a very gifted author, uh, but she has no formal training as a writer. So um, one of the most uh, maddening but also attractive features of her of her texts is that uh, they're very colloquial, very conversational. They say it's just like it's, reading her was just like listening to her talk. Um, let's see. OK, you, you put me back on the. Um, now, the books she wrote were mostly I mean, they were written for particular reasons, and that's always important to, to remember when you're reading Teresa. Who was she writing for and why? Um, uh, a lot of them were written at the command of confessors or directors who wanted uh, a, a, a more complete explanation of her spiritual experiences. And that's how the book of her life starts, her, her spiritual autobiography. Or they asked her for a history of her foundations. So she writes a book that's known as The Foundations, talking about all the, the, one, the ones that she established. Or she was asked by the sisters uh, in her reform to, to explain their vocation, and that's how the way of perfection was, was uh, written. Or she wrote things as part of her administrative responsibilities, her, um, uh, hundreds of letters. Um, and sometimes she just wrote things for personal enjoyment or devotion, like some poems. Um, uh, so, but remember, as I said, she had three strikes against her as a woman, uh, uh, a, 
a descendant of Jews and a, and a someone interested in mental prayer. And so, you know, a lot of times I think she's writing with that in mind. For example, she's very careful not to, to come across as a teacher sometimes. Like whenever she starts getting into a teacherly mode, she'll just say, well, you know, I'm just a poor, ignorant woman. What do I know? Of course, uh, you all are theologians. You know better than me. A lot of the self-deprecation, I think, is, is uh, I mean, because in fact, she does teach and so on, but it's, it's uh, you know, to kind of reassure the, the, uh, the, uh, the clerics who are examining her that she's not, she's not uh, um, uh, getting too high and mighty or something. Um, so I think that's one way to interpret her, her self-deprecation. She's, she, you know, she'll talk about, uh, she's about women's, um, uh, women being weak and, and so on. Her main writings, the book of her life, which is, as I say, a kind of spiritual autobiography, and I'll come back to that in a moment with the image of the four waters, how we grow in prayer, the way of perfection written for the nuns to explain their vocation to unceasing prayer and the prerequisites for that vocation. She says, humility, detachment, love of neighbor. And she ends with a long commentary on the Our Father, which sort of walks us through uh, a Theresian prayer. There's the interior castle, which is the most organized. And, and she, she, because she has one guiding image of the soul as this beautiful castle made entirely out of crystal with seven increasingly interior sets of rooms. Um, 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 and the Book of Foundations, uh, that's more history, but it's got a lot of digressions and, and much advice on, on different spiritual topics. Then there are things like her letters, poems, constitutions, and so on. Um, but uh, if we look first then at, at the book of her life, um, let me show you again some, some slides here. I think I, I'm going to go to, okay, slideshow for a slide, okay. Okay, before I get to, to these images, let me just say about the book of her life. Um, she said, I mean, it, she didn't give it that title. She wanted to call it the Book of the Mercies of the Lord. And uh, I've heard it said, too, that a lot of people say that she's really a kind of a pioneer in terms of spiritual uh, biography, because the lives of so many medieval saints are, are just a kind of a, a story of, of signs and wonders and so on. And somebody's leading a sinful life. And then all of a sudden they have this dramatic conversion and then everything is perfect from that on. But Teresa is very realistic about the spiritual life about, and she tells her own story about how, you know, every two steps forward, she'd slide back a step and so on. So she had a lot of ups and downs. Um, she also says in, in the book of her life that, it, and she says it in, in, the, in the interior castle as well, how important it is always to uh, uh, keep hold of the humanity of Christ. Because she had had some people who, who she thought were saying that, well, you know, as you grow toward more mystical prayer, you have to let go of all created things. And after all, the humanity of Christ is something created as well. So you just go into some pure abstract uh, experience of God and leave, leave the human Christ behind. She says, no, Christ, the whole Christ is, is necessary at every stage of the journey. Um, she has a famous definition in, in chapter eight of, of mental prayer. Uh, which she says is, uh, in, in my opinion, is nothing else than taking time frequently to be alone with the one who loves us. It's an intimate sharing between friends, she says. So for Teresa, you know, her, her approach to prayer is not about trying to, to increase the number of prayers we say per day, but it's more about trying to cultivate that friendship with the Lord. And whatever helps us to do that, she, she encourages. And uh, in, in the book of her life, she also, you know, using herself as an example, she talks about the importance of, of having what she calls determined determination, that you have to keep uh, at this prayer, uh, no matter how long it takes, no matter how frustrated you feel, no matter how dry it may seem at times. Um, it won't always be that way, but, uh, but you know, we, we need to invest that effort. Uh, now, let me say something about the, these four waters that she talks about. Um, uh, here she's trying, she's talking about uh, four ways of watering a garden. Uh, and uh, uh, according to the way this image works, she wants to explain different degrees of prayer. Uh, we are the garden. God is the owner of the garden. And we, we, we're, uh, uh, we're the gardeners uh, of that uh, as well. 
um, uh, and uh, uh, you know that, that our task is is to work on pulling up the weeds and planting good good seeds of virtues. Uh, so we're you know we're cultivating this garden. Well, it's really God's garden, and He's giving the seeds and all of that. But th the point of that being that that, that you know you, you you grow in prayer not just so that you'll have these these uh, 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 higher experiences, but for the sake of virtue, so that you will grow in your in in your conformity to God's will. Uh, um, so that we'll grow in virtue. So God is ultimately the owner and God reaps the harvest. Uh, so what are these different ways of watering a, a, a garden? Well, the first one is, is uh, she compares to drawing water from a well. And she says that's what they understood in, in that day that she has what they call discursive meditation, which is if you've ever uh, done Ignatian meditation and so on. It, you, you sit down, you prepare yourself, you choose, for example, a scene in the scriptures, Jesus walking on the water or Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane and so on. You, you imagine the setting, you place yourself in it, you observe who's there, you uh, listen to what the Lord is saying to you, and you, you have a conversation. You, you tell the Lord what's in your heart and so on. And you make some good resolutions and, 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 uh, and uh, that, I mean, but that involves a fair amount of mental activity. Uh, you, we, have to, we have to do some uh, a considerable amount of work in that kind of prayer um, because you have to work on recollecting your senses. You have to try to focus on, on the theme of your, of your meditation. You have to follow through uh, and so on. Uh, so that one's the most laborious, but she encourages us to keep at it. Um, the second degree, what she calls the, the prayer of quiet, is, is more like a water wheel. The water wheel can be uh, cranked by hand or can be uh, done with a, a donkey taking it around. This is what they called a noria in her time. Um, and she says here, prayer is starting to be supernatural because it's not depending only on our own effort. So at this stage of prayer, it isn't yet very intense, but but the but your faculties, your imagination, your intellect, and so on are kind of being uh, gathered within. Uh, you're becoming more centered, and so on. Um, uh, uh, I mean, you can still think about other things, and so on, but you're 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 getting more focused, or recollected. Uh, in this kind of prayer, we feel inner quiet, peace, and satisfaction. The heart is focused on God. But we may not have a lot of things we need to say. We may just be kind of basking in God's presence in a kind of a gentle way. Uh, uh, then she says that the next stage upon, uh, beyond that is what she calls the sleep of the faculties, which is like uh, irrigating from a river or stream. And this is where now this, this recollection is becoming much more intense and kind of absorbing all of the attention, absorbing the mind and the heart uh, in a way that we're not controlling anymore. Uh, uh, it, it brings much more joy, she says, much more growth and virtue. Uh, uh, and she says there are different forms of this sleep of the faculty. So, sometimes it might be that the mind that's more in, uh, uh, caught up in God, maybe another time it might be the heart, your, your love is more uh, strongly absorbed in God and so on. But it's a, it's a kind of a more intense form of, of that uh, prayer of quiet. Until finally you get to the, to the fourth water, what she calls the prayer of union. And this is compared to a soaking rain. And here it's, it's brief, but very beneficial. I mean, it may last only for the space of a Hail Mary, maybe 20 minutes at most and so on. But in this uh, state of prayer, you, you kind of, you're so caught up in God that you lose all awareness of the out, of our world around you. Uh, now this is as far as she's gotten by the time that she's, she's writing the book of her life. So later on, she's gonna add some further stages uh, that she's experienced in this growth in prayer. Uh, uh, so that's, a, that's about the, uh, the book of her life. Before I go on to say something about the uh, interior castle, uh, let me just say briefly about the way of perfection. Um, there she says, Carmelites are called to unceasing prayer for the sake of the church. And uh, 
many commentators say that, well, I mean, Teresa is one of the first founders to realize the essentially apostolic purpose of contemplative prayer and the contemplative life. I mean, she's very clear with the nuns that they're not there to pray for their own salvation. People often think that, uh, uh, you know, Carmelite nuns join the convent because they're afraid of the world and they want to leave the world behind. But actually, they are very much in touch with the suffering of the world and that they see their vocation as bringing that all to the Lord in prayer. Um, now, you know, the people who, who uh, are totally secular say wouldn't understand what's the point of that. Um, but I think for, for Christians, we understand that, I mean, prayer is often the greatest service we can, we can lend to, to others, sometimes the only service. So, so that's, uh, I mean, she sees their vocation as very much for the sake of the church. Um, and uh, she mentions those three virtues that I, I noted, humility, detachment, love for one another as, as crucial if you're going to become contemplative. Teresa elsewhere says humility is walking in the truth. Uh, so it's not just um, criticizing ourselves or, or saying that we're, we're terrible and all of that. Um, no, humility is, is recognizing you know, what we are of ourselves, but also recognizing what God has done for us. Uh, and therefore, you know, trying to focus more on God's mercy and his graciousness to us than on, than on our own limitations. Um, um, she talks about, uh, um, you know, detachment is needed, not just from material things in the convent, but from also an over preoccupation with your, with your health, with your reputation, all these kinds of things. We, we need to be detached from that. She says all must be friends, that they should all strive to be affable. I mean, Teresa is known for her sense of humor. Uh, she talks about the importance of having good friendships. And she talks about the qualities to look for in, in a spiritual director. Uh, and uh, she gives a, a pretty simple and flexible method of mental prayer uh, that I'll come back to in a moment. We'll go through it, and that'll be our, our, our prayer practice for this evening. Uh, and in the way of perfection, she talks about a kind of uh, recollected prayer that we can achieve by ourselves with the help of God. So the way I understand it is, and she goes back and forth when she's trying to talk about recollection, is that you can go into a room and sit quietly and turn down the lights, put on soft music, start counting your breaths and so on. And we can produce a certain inner calm uh, that way which would, she would call you know, active recollection. But later on, as we grow in prayer, that's gonna come upon us sometimes when we least expect it, you know, that suddenly you're riding on, on a, a very busy bus or you're in, in a busy uh, restaurant or something, and suddenly you just kind of feel this peace flowing over you. Um, and that's, that's uh, contemplation for Teresa. That's, the, uh, that's a, a way of, of God reaching us in prayer. Um, um, Okay, so that's um, the, um, the uh, way of perfection. Now, let me say something about the interior castle. As I say, this is her, her, her most, uh, this is kind of her classic. Uh, it's the best organized and clearest. And by the time she writes it, she's reached the, 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 the highest state available in this life. Uh, so it's, it's more complete about the stages of prayer. But it's all centered around this idea that, that the soul is this beautiful crystal, uh, all made out of crystal with Christ dwelling in the innermost dwelling place. And it's made up of these successively more interior apartments or she, mansiones in, in Spanish. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and she's getting this idea from John 14 too. Remember, uh, Jesus says at the Last Supper, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Um, and I mean, Father Kieran Kavanaugh, our, our, the translator for ICS publications, uh, decided when he was writing, doing his translation of the interior castle, that he was going to, instead of using mansions, he was going to use dwelling places. Because that's what uh, now the translation has for John 14 too. And mansions can be a bit misleading because when Teresa's talking about these seven mansions, they're not separate buildings. Uh, she's talking about a huge complex in which there, there are these uh, kind of seven sets of um, rooms and so on as you, as you go further in. So uh, that's why he translated as, as dwelling places. Uh, <clears throat> so 
because you know we're, she imagines the human soul in this way she she spends a number of chapters at the beginning of the interior castle just talking about the the unbelievable dignity of the human person being made in the image and likeness of god and having god within it now when, when sin comes you know that gets coated over with pitch and so on but there's still once you get rid of the sin it's still the same beauty within uh, and unimaginable dignity um, and she says that the door of entry into this uh, castle is prayer and reflection and she's aware that it's a bit paradoxical that if we are the castle how can you know i mean you know we're the castle and also we're the one who wants to get to the center of the castle uh, so we're like the traveler and, and the building in which he or she is traveling but she says, well, I know that sounds paradoxical, but we all know what it means that some people kind of live on the outskirts of their lives uh, in a very superficial way. And, you know, that's what she's talking about is that we have to learn to go uh, within uh, through prayer and reflection. Uh, so she, she divides it up into, into uh, uh, seven sets of, of dwelling places. And I won't go through them all in detail, uh, but the first three are, are for basically for beginners. Uh, and she doesn't spend a lot of time on this, that the first dwelling place are beginners, who, those who want to come inside the castle. Now, they still have many distractions, little inner illumination, but they have some good intentions. She says they need to grow in self-knowledge. In the second dwelling place, these are people who started to pray more seriously and regularly. Um, they're making greater efforts because they're beginning to hear God calling them. Uh, they can't fully respond yet, they still have distractions and so on. But, uh, but here Teresa says, you know, if you make it to the second dwelling place, then keep on, uh, be persistent, uh, don't give up, uh, you're making progress. The third dwelling place is kind of where, where you get to some stability. Uh, these are people who, they're pretty good Christians. They guard against venial sins, they do penance, they're reasonable, they're respectable, but she says they easily get distressed over small matters, gossip, loss of money and so on. They suffer through aridities in their prayers. Um, their, their satisfaction in prayer usually comes through their own efforts. Um, you know, people I've heard commentators say, these are kind of the, the average good, but not great Christian. I mean, these are people that are, are not bad. They're doing well and, and they're, they're doing what they can, but um, they've kind of reached a plateau. So it's going to be now that the next stage is starting with the fourth dwelling place where God starts to take more of the initiative. Um, so the fourth dwelling place is a kind of a transitional phase where you have a confusing mix of contemplative and, and apostolic and I'm sorry, active and contemplative prayer. So sometimes it's our effort, sometimes it's God working in us. Um, this is where she talks about that passive prayer of recollection that I mentioned where it's something very simple, but, and you don't even know, did I do anything to, to bring this about? Did it just happen? But all of a sudden I feel this, this peace flowing over me, uh, or I feel my attention is being gently drawn inward unexpectedly. She says, you can't force those moments. And if you try to force it, you'll, you'll just, it'll just leave you dry. Um, and as long as we can still do meditations, we should, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but as prayer now gets, uh, contemplative prayer gets stronger, that's going to uh, become more difficult. Um, as we said, in the prayer of quiet, there's, there's a stronger adhesion of our will to God's. Um, um, and here she makes an interesting distinction between uh, gustos, what she called spiritual delights, which originate in God, and contentos, which are consolations, which originate in our own efforts. So she has this comparison of two troughs of water, one where the water has to be brought by pipes from far away. Um, say it's a trough for, for watering your cattle or something. So, so the water has to be brought in from afar. And that's like, you know, the consolation we get when we work hard at our prayer and we feel some satisfaction in that and so on. It's good, but it's largely the result of our own graced efforts. But uh, the, the gustos, she says, that's like when the basin is right over the, uh, the, uh, the, the spring. And not only that, as it gets filled with water, it expands to accommodate more. So when you get to this stage in prayer, your, 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 your interior life is growing. God is stretching us to, to receive more uh, than before. Uh, uh, 
she says, now many people enter this fourth dwelling place, but they don't, a lot many get beyond. Uh, in the fifth dwelling place is where she now puts the prayer of union, where, uh, you know, all the faculties are silent, suspended, and so on. And she says this usually takes, you know, a half hour or less. Um, people don't understand what's going on, but, uh, um, uh, but she, she has a comparison here of a silkworm. Um, during this time, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of in, in this cocoon of prayer, uh, unaware of what's going on around. And yet when it emerges, it, it sees that it's been so blessed by this experience um, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, sorry, I'm admitting uh, people who are in the waiting room there. <laughs> okay. Sorry, uh, uh, LJ, you may need to admit some people who are in, in the waiting room. I'm not sure how to do that here. Um, All right, we'll do. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's the point of this, this image that uh, in this kind of prayer, it's like, it's like the soul goes into a kind of cocoon for half an hour or something and, re and emerges just kind of filled with new uh, strength of virtue and, and so on. Uh, so it's really helping uh, the progress. Um, um, what's important here, though, is the growing union of our will with God's will. Not so much that we're feeling great things, but that we're, we're uh, learning to do God's will. The sixth dwelling place, uh, which I don't have a picture for, is, is uh, where what she calls betrothal occurs. And uh, this is the longest section of this interior castle. And a lot of people got, get bogged down there because she's talking about all the kinds of unusual experience that can can happen visions and voices and raptures and flights of the spirit and so on um, but it's clear for Teresa by the time she she gets to the end that uh, those things aren't really essential and not everybody is going to have those kinds of experiences uh, but what's 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 characteristic here is that the experience of God is becoming more intense and it causes a great deal of suffering when it when it isn't kind of completed, but it passes uh, and, and we're back where we were before. Um, until finally, we reach the, the seventh dwelling place, uh, which is uh, uh, what she calls spiritual marriage, what other mystics call spiritual marriage. Then you reach the center of the soul and this union with, with God there at the center of the soul is, is constant, consummated. Um, uh, and at this point now, there's, there's no further separation of the soul from God. She says, betrothal was like joining the flames of two candles, which can be separated again, but the marriage is like a stream entering the sea. Um, interestingly, the visions and the voices and so on largely cease, and in its place is rather this, this kind of continuous awareness of the presence of the Trinity in the center of the soul. Uh, but at the same time, a greater availability to the needs of, of those around us. And the soul has been healed from its sinfulness, from its resistance to God and, and so on. Uh, and it's always ready to be of service to others. And it has no other desire than to please the beloved. And uh, she says, you know, that, that, uh, that um, this is the reason for prayer, my daughters, the purpose of this spiritual marriage, uh, not for our own satisfaction, but for the birth always of good works, good works, obras, obras, she says. Uh, she says, let us desire and be occupied in prayer, not for the sake of our enjoyment, but uh, so as to have the strength to serve. So she says, Martha and Mary have to join together here. So these are, are just, I mean, a very brief introduction to some of the key points in Teresa's teaching, which I would just summarize real quickly as, uh, I mean, these are just a few of them. There are many more that I haven't had time to mention, but the dignity of the human person. We don't recognize the depths of our own soul, what we're capable of, what, you know, what God loves in us and so on. Uh, we need to grow in self-knowledge. We need to grow in humility. But that always means being also aware of, of God's infinite love for us uh, rather than focusing on our limitations. Uh, for Teresa, also another important point, prayer is about friendship with Christ. And Christ has got to be there at every point of the journey. Um, and we're all called to grow in that. Uh, so you don't need a lot of spiritual uh, 
uh, gurus to tell you how to pray and so on. I mean, it's helpful to have a spiritual director. It doesn't have to be anything very complicated, but just try to grow in, in your love of Christ, uh, however that works best for you. And realizing that as, you know, with someone we love, we try to be more pleasing to them. So as we grow in that relationship with Christ, we're going to become more, more virtuous, hopefully. Uh, she says, uh, you know, we need determined determination, how, however difficult it might seem, but prayer is not about thinking much, but about loving much. Now, I've seen commentators who claim that Teresa teaches a kind of thinking prayer, and I don't get that. I mean, that's not, I don't think that's true. Um, of course, she's happy if we engage our minds with holy thoughts and so on, but ultimately, you know, love is what this prayer is supposed to be leading to. Uh, her approach to prayer is very flexible. Sometimes people say, you know, you could sum it up as pray as you can. Don't try to pray as you can't. Uh, do, she says, do whatever best moves you to love. And though she was prone to these extraordinary mystical graces, she realizes they're not essential, uh, but rather it's for the birth of good works, as we say. So uh, the authenticity of our prayer is gonna be judged by its fruits. Uh, and uh, we're doing this not for ourselves, but for, for uh, uh, the sake of the church and the world as we, as we grow in prayer. So scholars may argue over the differences between the different stages she describes, and, but um, you'd have to say the overall trend in Teresa is that as we grow in the spiritual life, we grow from activity to receptivity, from complexity to simplicity, from inner disharmony to harmony, from distance from God to union with God, from self-preoccupation to service, and from fear to love. So thank you very much for, for listening to all of that. And uh, I think i uh, take a few more questions before we, we go into the uh, uh, prayer practice, if you want to stick around for that. So do we have more questions? Elgin? We do, Father. Uh, there's one I skipped over from Kathleen. She says, uh, you mentioned that the nuns did not chant the divine office. Can you explain more about this? Okay. Well, I said they chanted recto tono, not Gregorian chant. Uh, so the point of that was that uh, she thought that they were spending a lot, you know, I mean, it was another way of, of making more time for quiet personal prayer because if you're if you're doing Gregorian chant you have to have choir practice choir practice takes time and so on but if you're just saying oh God come to my assistance Lord make haste to help me um, you don't normally need to practice that very much so uh, it was uh, again simplifying parts of their life to make it more amenable to to um, that contemplative prayer I mean yeah that's how I understand it anyway great yeah. And then um, <clears throat> Sharon asks, does the rosary or novenas and devotional prayer fit into St. Teresa's prayer scene? Well, I would assume it does. I mean, because she would have, as a religious, I think she would have been saying all of the usual uh, uh, vocal prayers, the Liturgy of the Hours and so on, the devotions. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so... Yeah, again, and if that if that's the prayer that works best for one, I think that's the way one should pray. In fact, she gives us an example that, you know, in, in the way of perfection, she's talking to a nun, trying to tell her about contemplation. The nun doesn't want to hear anything about it. She says, uh, I don't want, that scares me. She says, I just say the Our Father. Um, so Teresa asks her, well, how do you say the Our Father? She says, well, you know, after every phrase, I pause and ponder it and so on. She says, well, exactly, you're doing mental prayer. You know, that, uh, so, uh, so I think there's a place for all of those devotional prayers. Um, it's just that I think the, the, where we run into trouble is if we're always doing all the talking and not doing any listening. You know, if we're just rattling off prayers, then I think she would be against that. So. Okay. Great. And there's another uh, longer one. Okay. You mentioned that St. Teresa advises us to do in prayer that which causes us to lean into love. However, we are also told that we should not rely on consolation as an interpretation of love. How can we discern what is pleasing to God in prayer? Uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Well, again, I think it it comes back to what I was saying about by, by your fruits, by their fruits, you you will know them. If our prayer is making us more charitable, if we're feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, and so on, if that's helping us to do that, then that would be a good sign that uh, that our prayer is pleasing to God, even if we're not feeling uh, much consolation from it. Um, uh, so I think you 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 judge that by uh, by how it's helping you to grow in virtue rather than by whether you're having um, consoling feelings or not. But uh, with all of that, I think it, just to say, and she, she would agree on this, it helps to have a good spiritual director. They're hard to come by, but uh, somebody outside of yourself can, can often kind of set you right if, you're, if, you, if you, your prayer seems to be going off track. Um, so, I mean, that's what I, I would suggest. I'm sure there's a more complete answer to the question, which I don't have at the tip of my fingers. So, yeah. And that's it for now. Okay. So are we ready to have a little bit of Theresian prayer? Okay, let me explain what I'm going to do here now. Um, uh, let's see if I can. Now, I, I took this from the, uh, um, how can I enlarge it to fit the screen here? Okay, there we go. Um, and uh, I'll read it, but you'll be able to, to read it on the screen too. I think, can I increase the size of that uh, so you can see it better, maybe? Let's see, let's try it. Okay, and I'll scroll through this as we're doing it. Now, you know, as I was saying in, in the book, The Way of Perfection, the sisters are asking, well, how should we pray? And uh, Teresa is not a great one for methods and so on, because she says that you can pray in lots of different ways. But then when she gets to chapter 26, she kind of walks the sisters through what uh, a Teresian mental prayer meditation might be like. And if you read that chapter 26, I've, I've left out big chunks of it, but you'll, you'll get a more complete a view of what this so-called Teresian method of prayer is. Uh, so uh, uh, let's begin then. And I'll pause after reading each section so we can pray through this together. Okay, I'll read it. As is already known, the examination of conscience, the act of contrition, and the sign of the cross must come first. In other words, prepare for prayer. Then daughters, since you are alone, strive to find a companion. Well, what better companion than the master himself who taught you this prayer, the Our Father? Represent the Lord himself as close to you and behold how lovingly and humbly he is teaching you. Believe me, you should remain with so good a friend as long as you can. Yes. If you grow accustomed to having him present at your side and he sees that you do so with love and that you go about striving to please him, you will not be able, as they say, to get away from him. He will never fail you. He will help you in all your trials. You will find him everywhere. Oh, sisters, get used to this practice, get used to it. I'm not asking you now that you think about him or that you draw out a lot of concepts or make long and subtle reflections with your intellect. I'm not asking you to do anything more than look at him. If you are joyful, look at him as risen. Just imagining how he rose from the tomb will bring you joy. The brilliance, the beauty, the majesty, and all of that plus himself he desires for you.
If you are experiencing trials or are sad, behold him on the way to the garden. What great affliction he bore in his soul, for having become suffering itself, he tells us about it and complains of it. or behold him bound to the column. So much suffering, persecuted by some, spit on by others, denied by his friends, abandoned by them, with no one to defend him, frozen from the cold, left so alone that you can console each other. O Lord of the world, my true spouse, you can say this to him if he has moved your heart with pity at seeing him thus. Are you so in need, my Lord and my love, that you would want to receive such poor company as mine? For I see by your expression that you have been consoled by me. If it's true, Lord, that you want to endure everything for me, what is this that I am suffering for you? Of what am I complaining? I desire to suffer, Lord, all the trials that come to me and esteem them as a great good, enabling me to imitate you in something. Let us walk together, Lord. Wherever you go, I will go. Whatever you suffer, I will suffer. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. So that is um, an example of, of the so-called Teresian method of prayer. Later authors tried to formalize this into a, a method with various steps of so first preparation, then you select the material, a mystery or whatever you want to meditate on. Then you have a consideration where you reflect on that uh, subject then a conversation like Teresa has here with the Lord and a conclusion where you express gratitude uh, to God for the favors received and uh, you, you resolve uh, to, uh, to do better in the future. You make good resolutions and so on. That's a kind of typical method of mental prayer if you compare it with the Ignatian method or the De La Salle method and so on. So she knew of that and she encouraged her nuns to do that. But she also, as I say, was very flexible. She says, sometimes, you know, if that's just not working for you, go for a walk, look at flowers and, and water, uh, or uh, get, get a good book to, with you that you can rely on. You know, if you get, if it gets very dry, you can maybe read a few paragraphs or um, uh, uh, any, anything of that sort. Take a, take a familiar prayer and recite it slowly. Um, these are all ways, that, or she says, sometimes if it's just not working at all, go do something good for somebody, you know, rather than you may not be in the chapel praying, but you're, you're showing your love for God by, by doing some charitable service. Um, so uh, all of those things, uh, she says, uh, are, are legitimate ways of, of approaching uh, prayer. Um, so uh, uh, next time too, because John of the Cross doesn't give us a method for uh, prayer, we might, we might Again, call on St. Teresa to tell us a little more about, about how to go about praying. But that's basically what I had for this evening. And uh, I didn't know if, if any of you want to stay around for it. I had a little re recording of uh, the Tizé, uh, uh, you know, the monastery of Tizé, where they do the Tizé chant, singing Nada Te Turbe of uh, St. Teresa, her prayer that we prayed at the beginning, let nothing disturb you. So, but let's see, before we do that, are there any final questions? Okay. So far, I don't see any, Father, okay. so go right ahead. So we, we timed it fairly well, I'm amazed. I, uh, I thought I would either be way under or way over, but uh, I, 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 I'll just put on the, the Tizé and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, LJ will, will 
close it after after that's over, but you're welcome to leave if you need to leave. Uh, and we'll see you in two weeks if you're interested in, in coming back for the one on John of the Cross. So let me try screen share again and see if I can get this to work. Let me, uh, sorry, I need to go go back and make sure that I, I've got the, uh, um, what did you say um, that I need to make sure under the uh, video settings? Click um, on uh, share audio. Under, uh, in which window? When you click on uh, your share screen, uh -huh. you, you click on that, that window that says at the bottom, share audio and click on that. Okay, good. Sorry about this, folks. I'm I'm not the, a technical genius. So. Uh, oh yes, okay, it's all set up then. If I can find it again, good. Okay.
I turn it back to you, LJ. Well, thank you so much, Father Stephen. We really appreciate your wisdom on St. Teresa of Avila. And I just wanted to tell folks that we will be back on March 22nd, so two Tuesdays from now. And we'll be back to talk about John of the Cross. If you'd like to see a recording of this, I'll be emailing one to Father. He may put one on the center's website, but there will be one on the website for the Cathedral of St. Matthew. Otherwise, have a great night. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Yeah. Take care.